So, good afternoon. Daylight saving uh, over team. Good evening. I'm not really sure what it's now. Uh, so, proud and delighted to introduce Dr. Hortensia Soto. Really enjoyed having a sit in on our design based research forum uh, seminar this afternoon. Bringing so much value. Thank you very much. Dr. Hortensia Soto uh, originally hails from Nebraska where she received both a bachelor's in mathematics and a master's in mathematics education at Chadron State College. Uh, she then got another MA in mathematics at the University of uh, Arizona at Tucson, where I spent my weekend. Uh, and finally, a PhD in educational mathematics at the University of Northern Colorado at Greeley, where she's now a professor. So we have at least one Colorado person here, right? At least one. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Soda's research is on teaching and learning of K through 16 mathematics with an emphasis on assessment, perceptual motor activity, and complex variables. Hortensia is a dedicated advocate for equity and is active in facilitating an absolutely wonderful outreach program and annual summer camp, uh, Las Chicas de Matemáticas, that gives many first generation female Colorado college aspirants mostly Latina high school students, a simulated college experience. Mm -hmm. And these girls do go to college and even graduate school, and many years later, Tense is still getting invitations to weddings. <laughs> so she has a big print on many people's lives. This year, Tense, in fact, received the Burton W. Jones Distinguished Teaching Award for, uh, from the Rocky Mountain section of the Mathematical Association of America. <coughs> Hortensia and I keep running into each other at our globe-trotting workshops and conferences, and I've been generally impressed by her work, such as the ingenuity of her collaborative embodied activities for mathematics teachers' preparation and training. And I greatly look forward to this presentation so that I can learn more about this line of research on inclusive classroom instruction across the ages. So please welcome Hortensia. I want to thank Dor for inviting me and Lloyd for helping to organize everything. I'm very excited to be here. And I know uh, we have always have a slide at the end of a presentation that says questions, but my philosophy is that if you have a question, ask it whenever you have the question. Okay, I think it's always best to address it at that point in time. So I have so many things that I want to share, and we're just going to get as far as we can. All right, that's going to work. But no matter what, we're going to have fun. That's always my goal. Um, and so I have a lot of stuff prepared. And I had an activity that I wanted to end with at the end of the session. And last night before I went to bed, I was like, oh my gosh, but what if I don't get to that? And then it clicked. Oh, well, start with that. OK? So here are how things are going to hopefully progress. Hopefully this little clicker is going to work. So how are we going to move things along today? Um, well, we're going to start by moving a little bit. I want to tell you a little bit about my workplace because uh, people always ask me, how do you get your students to do this? And there's really a culture in my department where this is what everybody does. Okay, So I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of moving research to practice. And then I want to talk about my research agenda. And then from there, I'm going to talk about a little bit of uh, literature review that informs my research agenda. And then I'm going to go back and forth talking about my research to classroom. And uh, But of course, sometimes what happens is we do research, and that leads to more research. And so sometimes what I'll do is I'll talk about this research agenda, how that has moved forward to other research. But I'll briefly talk about how that has moved into the classroom. And then at other point in times, so I'll talk briefly about the research and delve more into how I've moved things into the classroom, just so you get a little bit of flavor of how, um, how I do all of this. And then, of course, there'll be time for questions. All right, so are we ready? You guys, do you guys, did you guys read the abstract where it said, bring your fun meters? <laughs> OK, so I hope you all have your fun meter, because I need you all to stand up. We're going to get moving. So it doesn't matter where you're facing, but what we're going to do is we are going to be like uh, the center of a rotation. And what we're going to do is we're going to move, we're going to rotate, I'll use my big mathematical sexy terms, we're going to rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise. Okay? So how about we all do that? 
rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise. And now we're going to rotate another 90 degrees counterclockwise. Okay. How much have you rotated? How much? I oh a total amount. Oh, 180. Sorry, I just can't hear. I guess. <laughs> How about you all turn around and you guys can tell me about that experience so I can hear you. All right. So you rotated 180 degrees. How do you know that you rotated 180 degrees? Yes. 90 plus 90. 90 plus 90. Very good. How? Any other ways? Yes. 180 degrees is a half turn. Is a half turn, and what does that mean? A half turn of what? Uh, pointing. <laughs> oh, okay, so can you elaborate on that a little bit more? First I was facing west and then I was facing east. Okay, very good. Can anyone revoice what he just said in another way? Of how I was facing originally. Okay, so you're facing in the opposite direction that you were originally facing. Okay, very good. So, yes? It's, 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 it's half because the whole is 360. Yes. So, so number 180 on, in and of itself is arbitrary. Yes, very good. So when people say I made a half a turn, I'm like, well, half a turn in reference to what? Okay. Uh, just like when we talk about fractions, when we talk about a third, we need to know what the whole looks like in order to really get an idea of what a third looks like. And so this is the idea of these questions that I try to facilitate. So go ahead and have a seat. Um, I want to just kind of quickly demo uh, something that some of my students do when they do this activity. Um, so a lot of times when I say, okay, we're going to rotate, they immediately do this. Why do you think they might do that? Because they're thinking about rotation above this axis as opposed to this axis. Yeah, so, that, so they know that they're usually going to be the center of rotation. Mm -hmm. and they're also used to that they know this is what I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe also that that makes a circle if they were to rotate all the way around? Very good. What else? Go ahead. You have a stronger sense of the start because otherwise your body is pretty narrow compared to your wingspan being larger. Like Very a good. Frame of reference. A yeah. frame of reference. Very good. What else? You have a thought. Oh well, it, uh, like uh, like uh, figure skaters, it it balances you and it reduces the uh, speed at which you rotate. Okay. Very Keeps good. Your center mass a little bit. Uh, Very good. Over your toes. Very good. Anything else? Well, some people, when I ask them why they're doing this, they're like, I'm imagining that I'm a big protractor. Okay? And so that, that beca and the, because they see me do this all the time, of like, okay, we're going to rotate 45 degrees. And so for them, this is like they're rotating their entire protractor. And so now this is at 90 and then the 180. Okay? So they have all different sorts of ways that they think about it, but this point of reference is actually very, very important. And how they associate it to their experiences, I'm uh, interested in the fact that you use this idea of an ice skater because uh, dancing comes into play quite a bit with this next activity in particular that we're going to do. All right. So students are pretty happy at this point in time that rotating 180 degrees about uh, our center really means that we're now facing in the opposite direction, All right? So from there, we're going to look at this activity that I do with elementary students. I do it with pre-service elementary teachers. I do this with my in-service uh, teachers when I do professional development. But the goal is to discover what the sum of the angles of a Euclidean triangle is. Now, of course, in-service teachers know this. They know it's 180. But what I like to try to provide are opportunities so that they can reason about these conclusions or these facts that they already know in different ways. And there's numerous, numerous activities out there to convince students that the sum of the angles of a, the interior angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. We cut the angles, we do the gluing, we do all of those activities. Okay, we do several activities, but we also do this activity that we're about to do. All right. So uh, I don't know if any of you have had an opportunity to come forward to look at my great type triangle that I have over here. I told you you wanted to sit up front. Okay? So I need a volunteer. Thank you.
And you guys should feel free to stand and come walk around. Stand here and uh, just look. Feel free to sit around the floor, however you want to do this, whatever's best for you. Go ahead. Yeah, the light is fine right now because we don't need this. All right, so what I have right here is a triangle, and I've set it up purposefully this way. Um, I don't usually start off with this extension where you can see the exterior angles, but I knew I usually need them, so I want to go ahead and talk about them. Okay? So here is the objective. What I want you to do, Leah, is to travel the sum of the interior angles of the triangle. Okay. To traverse them. <laughs> traverse the triangle, like walk around yeah. the triangle? Yeah, to traverse and to follow the angles. Okay. So, so she's going across an edge. Mm -hmm. Going this way. Okay. Will you go back? Did you guys all see what she did? <coughs> she rotated. She rotated. Okay. Okay, go on. <laughs> Home run. <laughs> okay, but it feels like I'm turning more. Right, I'm not turning back. Well, which direction did so you end up facing, Leah? So I finished going this way. I started. Have you traversed the last angle? Oh, if I go this way, then I go the same way, the same direction as I started. So, so how much did she rotate? She's facing the original direction. Based on that, I would say 360. We would say 360. Yeah. So is the sum of the interior angles of a triangle 360 degrees? supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> so what has Leah really done? Has she traversed the sum, the interior angles? It was what are you doing right here? What um, is all this gesturing uh, that you're doing? I am pretending Go. that I'm her. Like okay. I, I'm, my what? hand is, uh, I'm trying to do what she did with her body with my finger. Okay, could you kind of maybe come and try to do that and use your finger as a guide to illustrate what Leah did? So she started out. Yeah, go start where she was. Oh, with my hand or with sure, <laughs> however you want. Well, I was remembering that she started out facing this way, so I guess I'm pointing in the way that her she was facing. Okay, so use that finger and. And then I was thinking about she faced this way. Yeah, what, what was the rotation that you made? Yeah, Use that finger. Maybe pray, take your finger now down to the vertex and illustrate okay. the rotation that happened. Well, that's why I was, that's why I was thinking about uh, over there. I was, I was trying to figure out how she could really rotate. Like, do I want to, to end here and then to rotate? No, then I guess I'm missing some of the triangles. So then do I want to go out here and rotate? So that's what I was trying, kind of trying to figure out. And when she was walking, I was thinking, how is she? She's not a, she's not a dot. She's a 3D she's a person. object. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking, yes. <laughs> but I was just thinking, like, how uh, to make use of the space to actually what I'm thinking in my head. So, um, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think I heard you say something earlier. External angles? Like, yeah, yeah, so what is it that Leia has really traversed? Has she traversed the interior angles? The supplement of the interior angles. Yeah, and we call those exterior, exterior angles. So she has really traversed the exterior angle. Okay? Oh. If you were a logo turtle. Okay. I think I've so does anybody have an idea of how we might traverse then the interior angles and would like to try it? Come on. Notice as soon as you make any sort of movement, I'm going to call on you. So we'll go this way and then this way. Yes. Okay, just pause right there for a while. So what happens is students don't want to do that. Why? Walk yes, it's like, wait a minute, this requires that I walk backwards. 
It's cheating. Uh, yeah, well, it's not natural. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Yeah. So continue on. Whoops. That's not where she started. Yeah. Well, right, because it's 180. Right? It's 180, right? So now we're good. We're good. Yes? Does that make sense? Well. Go ahead, say it. Uh, it kind of depends if she pivots at the last part or not. Which she I should. Have to right, so I, I do have to traverse that angle because I didn't initially. Yeah. 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 yeah, so she really started at this, at this vertex and is thinking about traversing first this side of the triangle and then rotates, walk backwards, rotates, walks forwards, and then rotates the angle. Mm -hmm. Or you could okay. start on the blue one and yes. the turn mm -hmm. first. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Would, yes. would it help in that case if, if the purple string had been extended rather than the... Uh, well, this is how why I said I was purposeful in terms of how I laid it out. Because originally when I start off with this activity, there is no exterior angles the way I have showed them right here. I usually just start with the triangle, the vertices are at the corners where things join up. And there's all sorts of confusion because then what happens is they get here, they're not really sure what the angle is and what happens is they end up traversing this entire angle. Okay, which causes even more confusion. Okay, we've rotated more than 360 at the end. And so then I modify it and extend it to the exterior angles because we, I say, okay, well, what is the interior angle? How can we figure out what that is? And so then we modify, modify the ropes. Okay? Question. Yes. <clears throat> Have you had any experiences where without that line there? Uh, the extension? Of, correct. Um, uh, participants are able to like import like visualize that that's the angle no not at least not with the audience that I have worked with uh, and in fact I just did this very same activity uh, with freshly minted PhDs as professional development and they they knew what the interior angle was but they had no idea what then that meant to traverse that thing and the thing that was getting them caught up was the same idea that gets kids caught up, is that they had to walk backwards. And they were like hesitant to do that. Okay? Questions, comments, concerns? Do you ever get students like disagreeing because it feels wrong to walk backwards? That like, they're like, well I cheated or that wasn't like how you walk, so that means the result is it's not that the, the word cheating doesn't come up, it's unnatural. Mm -hmm. and, and I never, I usually say very little in these activities. If the students who are having the conversation, I tend to ask questions like, well, why, why did you rotate that? Why isn't it this one? Because they'll say things like, it can't be this because then I'll have to walk backwards. Mm -hmm. And then the other kids will say, well, why can't we walk, yeah. walk backwards? It's okay. So they convince one another that it's okay to walk backwards. Yeah, door. It's just the crazy design in me, I guess, but I'm kind of wondering when you, when you got here, uh -huh. it's going to be crazy, it's just an idea. If you had like a chalk on your shoe, mm -hmm. when you're doing this pivot now, this one, smearing. you're li literally smearing the, the uh -huh. line. So you say, I'm actually, mm -hmm. and, and the same with the other ones. Mm -hmm. So you're literally transcribing. Uh, it, this is exactly the sorts of conversations that we have. So earlier when you talked about the skater, I had a dancer in the class, and the way that she traversed the triangle was just so elegant. I wish I had videotaped it, because, you know, she's got her little pointer toe, and she's, I mean, it was just like, holy moly. It was, and then her walking backwards, it was amazing. And then one student, actually, and I thought this is what you were going to do, is he said, I actually am thinking about, like, an anchor, and that this is my boat, and I'm going forward and then here's the anchor so the ink he actually rotated way back here because he's seen the edge of his finger lining up with the vertex and swinging that around okay so there's all of these things that they bring from their own personal experiences into the activity um, that 
I, I loved the word anchor because it made me think of your intentional anchors and what is it that they're paying attention to. And some are very much attuned to their arms, some are very much attuned to their feet, okay? And some more so to their body. I've done this activity also like when I very first started doing this before I knew anything about embodied cognition, I would just have a triangle up on the board and I had a little car that would be driving around. Okay, so you can do all sorts of these things, and so now when I do this with kids, I actually have a little car that they can push around if they want. So, one more comment. Uh -huh. What I really like about what Mary did before, when, when you evoke this gesture, that's a lovely thing to carry over onto the paper. Yes, right? exactly, yeah. exactly. And this idea then, we have this nice conversation about well, what is an interior angle? What is an exterior angle? And is this thing the entire exterior angle and the thing that happens we accidentally because everybody does exactly what you do is they realize that the sum of the exterior angles is going to be 360 mm -hmm. so so they, they learn that mm -hmm. okay yes i'm not sure i understand what the word traverse means follow <laughs> Yeah. Because you said traverse the interior angles. Yeah. So I'm not sure why people were walking along the edges. Well, because it will traverse the triangle in order to get to the next angle. I We think about following the sides of the triangle. Right. I wonder how many people understand. Because I could imagine doing an alternative movement that would just be confusing. Well, I'm happy to, I'm happy always to hear for better language. I use the word traverse the sides and traverse the angles, but the goal is to figure out what the sum of the interior angles oh, are. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm always happy to, a better way to say it is. All right. Shall we continue on? Where do you want us? In the seat up front. <laughs> By the way, let's clap for everybody who volunteered. Yeah. We clap in my class all the time. All right, so uh, I wanted to say, uh, like I said earlier, I wanted to say a little bit about my institution. I am at the University of Northern Colorado. This is started off as a teacher's college. And I am, what I always like to say is I'm in a very special department. And I think everybody says that about their department. So I want to tell you what I think makes it special. Is that we, our majority of our math majors are going to be secondary teachers. We do have a very special program for our elementary teachers who want to get an emphasis in mathematics. And we have a PhD program in educational mathematics. And what's special about us is that we don't have a competing program, PhD program, in mathematics. So our uh, students take courses from mathematicians and math educators. We're all in the same building, and we're all very much committed to the education of our students. And we know that we're putting forth out teachers. Uh, the mathematicians are just as much invested in our PhD program as we are as mathematics educators. And so I feel like we have this very nice collaboration. And furthermore, the sorts of things that I just did with you guys is the sorts of things that we all do in our classroom. Maybe nobody else is doing embodied cognition at my university, uh, but people know that this is what I do. I know what other people are doing, and so we support one another. And our students are used to doing these sorts of things in our classroom. Okay, so I just wanted to point that out. All right, so research to practice. There's been a lot of criticism about uh, whether or not research in mathematics education is really accessible to the teachers. How might they use this? And not accessible usually means that it's not written in a way that it's understandable and easily taken into the classroom, okay? And so how might research influence practice? The NCTM and uh, several other researchers have talked about how to do this. Of course, teachers can read and implement, but as have others have said, usually reading it is not very understandable, okay? There, of course, are educational materials that are either put out by textbook authors, um, things that are a result of a grant, whatever, so those are ways to do that, but of course, then we have to train the teachers how to use these educational materials 
in such a way that we can connect it to the mathematics and not just be doing it for the sake of doing it. Um, and then, of course, there's training our pre-service and in-service teachers and really making them informed about research. How might we do this? I think it's as easy as the sorts of things that I just got done doing. Okay? And letting students know, hey, the reason we're doing this is because research shows that if you move, you learn, and that learning is moving. Um, of course, there's policy documents. Uh, and of course, one of the things that I always find with policy documents that can be problematic is that a lot of times uh, teachers are connect policy documents too much to assessment. So it's too much, the reason I have to do this is because my students are tested on this. And so that usually might not be the best rationale. And then the last one is, uh, of course, the public. And this is becoming quite uh, more prominent, I think. And the way that I see uh, changing or moving research into practice is really by popularizing mathematics. It's really helping to understand people that mathematics is important and helping the public to want to know mathematics, that it's cool to know mathematics. It's sexy to know mathematics, okay? Because it is, um, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, so at the same time that educational practitioners are unique consumers of research, they must also be the wellsprings of research. And I am a big believer of this. And so this is why one of the things that I really want to share today is how do I move these two things back and forth? So how do I use my students to help to move research forward, but how do I use research to move the ways that I do things in my classroom forward? All right? And as I mentioned earlier, um, it's not always that I go directly from research to practice. Sometimes I go from research to more research. Sometimes I go from practice to more practice. But this is the cycle that we tend to move, uh, move around. All right, so when I was a graduate student, uh, I was fortunate that I got to take several courses in complex analysis. The first three courses that I took, I learned how to do a lot of stuff. I had no pictures in my head whatsoever. And then the fourth course that I completed, I had from someone who every, you could just see all the pictures in his head, and they just seemed to pop out everywhere. And somehow I started developing some pictures in my head of complex analysis. And at that time I thought, wow, I wish this is what I was doing my dissertation on. But I, I was almost getting ready to defend my uh, proposal or my dissertation. So that wasn't a good time to be switching topics. But I did promise myself that one day I would do this. And 20 plus years later I got to start doing this. So this is my research agenda right now. What I wanted to do is, or I hope to and aspire to do at some point in time, is to develop a framework that might explain how we reason about complex variables algebraically and geometrically. Whatever that means and what I want was, you know, to be able to move back and forth between these two reasoning domains. And I wanted to contribute to curriculum, and, uh, curriculum development at the high school, collegiate, and professional development levels. And you might be wondering, well, why at the high school level? Uh, but at the time that I started this program, the Common Core State Standards came out. And if you look at uh, the Common Core, one of the threads in there is that students and teachers need to know how to think about the arithmetic of complex numbers geometrically. And I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I want to do. And I know that teachers don't know how to do this. And I started flipping through high school textbooks. And there were questions in there that said, you know, what does this mean geometrically? But of course, nobody assigns those things. And so I thought, OK, uh, this is important based on the Common Core State Standards. And I know that a lot of the teachers don't know how to think about complex numbers geometrically. So I want to provide materials for them. Can you provide me an example of what type of a question would make that transition? Yes. What does Z conjugate mean geometrically? So if you have the complex number A plus BI, what does the complex number A minus BI represent? Or 2 plus 3I and 2 minus 3I. What's the relationship between those two things geometrically? Okay. 
Um, and then I just wanted to revitalize this content domain. There was actually a group of mathematicians that were simultaneously thinking about, hey, we need to change this curriculum. And so everything just seemed to be coming together for me at the right time. And so this is what I've been dedicating the past six years to, is this research, and that's what I want to share with you today, and how that has filtered again into the classroom and into further research. So a little bit of lit review, of course, that's the first thing that we do when we start a new research project. And I was happy to find that there was not a lot of research done in this area. <laughs> um, so first of all, th there's three papers that were very instrumental in my research. Uh, Dan and Howard showed that undergraduates were unable to navigate between different forms of complex numbers. And by that, I mean that uh, they tended to work in the Cartesian form. So a lot of times we use the letter Z to represent a complex number, but we might write it in Cartesian form, A plus IV. We might write it in polar form, R E to the I theta. So these are standard ways to write complex numbers. And it seems that undergraduates tended to stay in that domain, all right? He also talks about this concept of thinking real, doing complex. And he asked his uh, research participants, for example, how do you guys think about the derivative of a complex valued function? And they said, oh, it's the slope of the tangent line. Well, what tangent line? And what does slope mean in the complex setting? Uh, and this is actually something that I've been able to see in my research also, and so I'll talk a little bit more about this, this idea of thinking real, doing complex. And it's not surprising that this happens because of a lot of the mechanical aspects of complex analysis work exactly the way that they do in the real setting, okay? But the geometry is very different, okay? And then a second paper by Panora and her group is she showed that high school students were unable to navigate between algebraic and geometric representations. That doesn't mean that they weren't competent in each of these domains. They were. They could work really well in the algebraic setting, but then unable to move to geometric reasoning. Or they could move real, do, do nice things geometrically, but then had no idea what that looked like algebraically. All right? So both of these are what I would say are the deficit model. They're like, okay, these are things students can't do. For me, that was good because I thought, well, okay, maybe there's an opportunity for me to show how we might move st students forward in this direction. And then the paper by Nemirovsky and uh, several of his colleagues showed that perceptive motor activities facilitated pre-service teachers' development of multiplication of complex numbers. I read this paper and I got very excited. And what uh, Ricardo in his paper did is he had, he was in a classroom that was a tiled floor. And so he used that tiled floor to represent the complex plane. Then he had stick-on dots so that they could use those to represent points on the complex plane. So that way you could think about a complex number not only as A plus IB, but it could be a point on the complex plane. And then he had string so that you could think about these complex numbers as vectors. And what he had the students do is multiply two complex numbers. And what was happening is because of the students' movement with this string, they were able to discover that, hey, if I multiply two complex numbers, it turns out to be a rotation and a dilation. Okay? And I got very excited. I emailed him, said, I'm getting ready to go on sabbatical. Can I come work with you? So that's what I did. And uh, it has really paid off uh, professionally, and he is a very good friend. All right, so I started to learn a little bit about embodied cognition, the philosophy that describes <coughs> reasoning as body-based, stemming from experiences with the physical environment. And we saw that happening today. Um, and the physical environment can be the environment that you've experienced before, whether it's dancing, ice skating, whatever, okay, being on a boat. Um, and there's lots of other definitions that are, that have, uh, that are around for embodied cognition, embodied cognition, 
Reasoning is based in perception and action. This tends to focus on mental models. Learning is doing. That's really the philosophy that I take, the definition that I like. Uh, I like this one by some guy named Abramson and his group that learning is moving in different ways. Um, so I found out, you know, well, wh what are ways that we utter? What are ways that we communicate our ideas? And Nimorowski talks about imagining. And he talks about this notion of realms of possibilities, uh, holding and keeping a state of readiness for the enactment of other possible actions. And that these things might occur via eye motion, facial expression, gaze, body poise, uh, sound production, body motion, hand gesture. And when I read this, I thought, wow, I already do all this sort of stuff. I mean, I'm always saying, hey, you have a look. I'm always saying, put your pencils down, look at my hands. I'm always saying, hey, put your pencils down and look at Joey's hands. Joey, do that with your hands again. What are his hands telling us? So I realized that I was already in this world. I was already in the moving business, okay? And I was excited about this. Uh, and so I set off to try to figure out how the heck I was going to change the world in complex analysis. I don't think that I have, but I'm having fun trying. But here was my strategy. I wanted to interview mathematicians first because I wanted to see how they thought about it, how they thought about it geometrically, and that how maybe that might inform the sorts of things that I might do with students to help them develop this geometric reasoning of complex numbers and the arithmetic of complex numbers. So I interviewed five mathematicians. They were from three different institutions. Three of them are, uh, have expertise in complex analysis. Another one has expertise in differential equations, and the other one in differential geometry, all right? Um, so I interviewed them about arithmetic and analytic tasks, and after I analyzed these data, I went and created these teaching materials that I have implemented and tested both in the classroom and via research. And, uh, and so that's this part about interviewing participants. And so I've used these materials with in-service teachers as part of professional development. I've used these with high school students as part of my math camp. I have used these with uh, math majors in <coughs> complex analysis courses. And I've used these with uh, pre-service secondary math teachers in a higher geometry course that the theme of that course is transformations. So let me start off by describing the arithmetic tasks that I asked the mathematicians. So I had this complex plane. I don't know. I just have this picture. I don't know how well you can see it, but this is Z and this is W. And I said, hey, here's these two complex numbers. Tell me where Z plus W is. Tell me where Z times W is. And tell me where 1 over Z is at. So I just wanted them to use geometric reasoning to determine uh, the point of these things. And of course, several of them said, I can't answer, for example, the multiplication and division question because they're like, you don't have the unit circle up there. So right away, that tells me that they're attuned to that they need to know whether these things have magnitude more than one or less than one. And I said, well, put it wherever you want, okay? But that was important to the mathematicians. Uh, and so what I found is that the mathematicians view the arithmetic of complex numbers as dynamic and associate it as transformations on the complex plane. And that they can easily connect the algebraic and geometric inscriptions. And you might be all saying, that's good. They should be able to do that, okay? Uh, but the important thing is I wanted to learn from them so that I could figure out how I might develop activities for my students. And so they talk about addition and subtraction as translations. I'm like, oh, my students know about translations. They should easily be able to get to that. Uh, they talk about division or multiplication as a rotation dilation. And they talk about, and I'm like, okay, my students know rotate and dilate. And they talk about division as an inversion about the unit circle composed with the reflection about the uh, real axis. And I thought, okay, my students don't know about inversions, but I can teach them about that. 
Okay, so that was what I needed. That was the game that I needed to play. So I just want to show you a little bit of evidence. Uh, oh, they recognize when to use the polar and Cartesian form. And so this is the idea of going back and forth between algebraic and geometric inscriptions. So I just want to show you a little bit of evidence from this. And I might quickly go through this uh, just so I can get to some of the other parts. So, you know, they talk about, for addition, I always think that the rectangular representation is much clearer because then they think about adding the real components and the imaginary components. And they see adding the real components as translating in the horizontal direction and adding the imaginary components as translating in the vertical direction. Uh, and so another person said, well, I think of moving. So right away, it's like this is a dynamic action. Okay? These are not just static things. So moving along the z vector is also a motion that has a horizontal component. And the total effect of moving along two vectors is to combine the two horizontal components. And then similarly for the vertical components. No. <laughs> Another Raphael. Not, these are all pseudonyms, by the way. Okay. <laughs> uh, so multiplication of complex numbers. I need to think of them in polar form. So I, I don't want to be in Cartesian form. I want to be in polar form. Because that's a natural way to multiply co complex numbers. And then Becky says, hey, well, we're, we're just going to add the moduluses, I'm sorry, add, add the angles and multiply the moduluses. And so she's right there thinking adding angles. Well, to me, I'm interpreting that, okay, rotate. And multiply the moduluses, I'm thinking, okay, dilate. Uh, and she goes on to talk about if you have numbers that are smaller than one, then things are going to get even smaller. And here's her things getting smaller bit. And then Rafael says, hey, well, with polar form, you can see the rotation and expansion properties early on. That's how the geometry comes into the story most directly. And he has this beautiful uh, gesturing that he does throughout the entire interview. I could just write a book about his responses. But anytime he use, uses the word multiplication, he does this. I actually videotaped his class, his complex analysis class, for eight weeks. Anytime the word multiplication comes out of his mouth. Constantly. Um, and, and this is part of that that he's doing right here is in another task. And, and you'll get to see the video for that. Okay. Uh, and then division of complex numbers. So again, 1 over z, it's division, right? It's the same family as multiplication, so I need polar representation. Right? So that's Luke. And then this is Judy right here. And she's like, oh, 1 over z. I immediately think of 1 over z conjugate. I immediately think about uh, inversions. And you can't see this very well, but I think that what she did is she had um, z right here. Here's her unit circle. And she said the inversion, so for inversions, things that are inside the circle pop outside the circle, and things that are outside the circle pop inside the circle. And so she's like, OK, here's my inversion. I'm going to pop out of the unit circle, and then I'm going to reflect uh, about the real axis. And if you think about how you divide 1 over z, where you multiply numerator and denominator by the conjugate, I mean, it, you just think. Duh, what else could it be? It can't be anything else but this. Okay? Um, so, nice example right there. So, what I did then is I went off and created these labs so that my students could explore the arithmetic of complex numbers. And that's um, what I want to show you next. So, how do we get others to develop this dynamic perception of arithmetic of complex numbers? And why do we care? Right? So the first part is I want to illustrate then how I've done this. And then the why do we care part, that's a research conversation that I want to talk about. Right? So let's see. I need to go. You can do all of this in GeoGebra. I tend to do all of these activities in GeoGebra with um, when I do professional development, because then the teachers have free access. In my class, I use Geometer Sketchpad because I really like what I can do with Geometer Sketchpad. Um, 
and it's, in particular, it allows you to incorporate images, and then you can act on an, an entire image. And I want to showcase that. I think I have to, there we go, move this. So this is, um, by the way, the students do this work and they just email me everything. I make sure everything works on Geometer Sketchpad. I can write comments on there and then just email it back to them. Okay. So this, I believe, oh, I can't see what I'm doing right here. Uh, this is, oh, this is the reciprocal. This is 1 over Z. So here's Z. They build, listen to that word build because this is their, their word. They build these functions or these transformations that will send a point Z, in this case, to 1 over Z. So notice if Z is on the unit circle, then 1 over Z is going to be on the unit circle. Z is outside the unit circle, 1 over Z is inside the unit circle, and vice versa. And then I have them incorporate images, and then they can act on those things. So you know, things that are, if you start up there, you're going to end up below the x, the real axis, and things inside go outside, and they can do all this funky stuff, okay, with Geometer Sketchpad. And uh, so they do the arithmetic of uh, complex numbers labs, they do the addition, multiplication, and division, and then I have them look at the function z squared and z cubed. And then what they have to do is they have to go and create a game that uses transformations. And I have a paper coming out in Primus that showcases this. And uh, my students are actually co-authors of this paper. But it helps them to really think about, I can actually force objects to do things that I want. And I talk about how our Pixar movies created. This is exactly the sorts of things that they use. And so they have an opportunity to use what they're learning with simple arithmetic of complex numbers to go off and build these very sophisticated games. All right? So that's, that's a little bit of what I do in the classroom. So let me kind of go back to my PowerPoint, if I can. Oh, here, I know what I want to do. I can just close this. Quit. Command tab. Will that command tab? what I've done with the students and again like I said I've done this uh, delivered these activities had the students create these functions both in-service teachers secondary uh, pre-service teachers high school students and all of these recognize then what the what these transformations are that are created by looking at the arithmetic of complex numbers and I have other research that I've looked at where I interview the students about what these things mean. And the thing that I find interesting is that they start to use similar gesturing to what the mathematicians have used. It, it's just amazing. And I'll show you another clip of this. So this is where they're talking about addition. They talk about taking the one vector and putting it on top of the other. And they talk about adding the horizontal components and the vertical components. <coughs> This is where they're talking about uh, multiplication. If you have vectors smaller than one, then things are going to shrink. Uh, this is a high school student talking about multiplication and how things are going to rotate. You can see her gesturing right there. This one, I'm putting this one up because the response was really interesting. They talk about z and 1 over z. And they use the notion that they know that z and 1 over z should end up being 1. And they say, okay, that means that the angles have to add up to 0. 
And that means that if something is bigger than 1, then I'm going to have to multiply it by something that has a magnitude less than 1. And so they're quickly able to sketch where things are at simply by thinking about that z and 1 over z are multiplicative inverses of one another. All right? Any questions so far? Let's see. For some reason, or to the technical <coughs> difficulty part of things. Ah, so the why do we care part. So one is that the students, the participants, start to gesture like mathematicians, which I think tells us a little bit about how they're reasoning uh, about the arithmetic of complex numbers. The other thing is that they're able to extend these ideas to other aspects of the arithmetic of complex numbers or algebraic aspects of complex numbers. So for example, I asked students several um, questions where they had to answer all of these geometrically and not write any algebraic symbolism whatsoever. So for example, 1 plus i to the fourth equals minus 4. The way that you can think about this is that 1 plus i lives over here in the first quadrant at 45 degrees. So there's 1 plus i. But when you multiply him 1 plus i squared, you now live on the positive imaginary axis. And the magnitude has been squared, so you now have a length of 2. And then you look at 1 plus i cubed, you're going to rotate another 45 degrees. So now you're in the second quadrant with a uh, a magnitude of 2 radical 2, and now you're going to look at 1 plus i to the fourth, so you live on the negative imaginary axis with a magnitude of 4, so that means that that has to be negative 4. Okay? Did you all catch that? Okay? Yes, 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 exactly. Rotate, dilate, rotate, dilate, exactly. Um, and so I had questions like this, and for this paper that we have published, we actually focus on these four tasks. Uh, give a geometric explanation as to why z, z bar is equal to the modulus of z squared. Give a geometric explanation for the statement if 1 over z is defined by 1 over z times z equals 1, that it follows that 1 over z equals 1 over r e to the i theta equals 1 over r e to the minus i theta. Give a geometric explanation as to why capital R e to the i phi over little r e to the i theta is equal to capital R over little r e to the i phi minus theta, and 1 over x plus i y equals this business right there. Okay? I focus on these four tasks because there is different symbolism. So we have the form of z, we have the uh, Cartesian form, and we have the polar form, and we have one that combines those. And so if you remember with Dan and Howard's work, he talks about how students aren't able to navigate between forms and that they tended to stay with the Cartesian form. So this was my reason for using these tasks as part of the research. And this is what we found, and I'll quickly go through this. So we found that technology facilitates dynamic reasoning. Might not be surprising, others have shown the same thing. The diagrams can come to life with gesture and verbiage. Not surprising, others have shown the same thing. Uh, and that gestures transform. Uh, the literature shows that when students are reasoning, they tend to gesture more. And that when we're explaining concepts, we tend to gesture less. So then it reduces down to pointing or that sort of thing. Okay? And we found the same thing with these tasks. And things that were new, uh, I think, in the literature is that, oh, well, this might not be new, is that gestures can be an indicator of ZPD or ratification. So this idea of the, of the reasoning part, I think that's, uh, that goes in line with L. Valdi and Derousse's work, uh, that gestures can bring algebraic inscriptions to life. So not just geometric figures, but algebraic inscriptions, symbolic uh, notation. And that students can create taking the shared gestures without direct instruction. And we kind of saw that when I talked about the students gesturing in a similar fashion as the mathematicians. Okay? And in fact, one of the students, after she did the arithmetic lab, and she had the aha moment of that it's rotate and dilate, she actually was in the course of that instructor that I told you kept doing this. 
And this is what she said. She said, oh, so it's a rotate dilate. And she did this gesture. And she looked at her hand and she's like, that's what he's doing? <laughs> now, it, so they have noticed the gestures, but they have no idea what they meant. And so that to me says, hey, we need to have our students pay attention to our gestures. And that's why for me it's important to say, put down your pencils, look at my hands. This is what I'm trying to tell you with my hands. But it was just amazing when she had that big aha moment, not only about what multiplication of complex numbers represents, but that's what the instructor was trying to tell her all along, and she didn't get that. Okay? Um, so, where am I? Oh, gosh, I'm about out of time. Uh, let me just quickly show these slides, and this is the evidence for those uh, comments that I made earlier. Uh, so here they're, again, using similar gesture to talk about rotating, and they know that things have to collapse down to, uh, down to the real axis, because they recognize that the modulus of z squared is positive, and it's a real number. So they know that things have to live out in the real axis, okay? Um, this next task, this task took them a long, long time. They worked on it for one day, and one person went off on one direction, which was, I thought, oh, they'll be there any second now. This person went off and looked at an example, and made an arithmetic error, and then they were convinced that neither one of them knew what they were doing, okay? Even though it was a silly mistake, and this person's work was exactly on target, but they couldn't reconcile that difference. And they got frustrated, we stopped, and the next day we continued, we came in, and they're like, okay, Z and one over Z, this is where they're at. And, and they just went through it really, really quick. They, um, they knew, again, okay, if Z is in the numerator, or up in the first quadrant, one over Z has to be in the fourth quadrant. They know that they're multiplicative inverses of one another, and so it has to come down to one. And that's what this moving uh, gesture is all about right there. And, she, and then they can uh, connect that to one over R e to the i theta. And she's like, okay, so instead of e to the i theta, we're just going to be rotating down, okay? So it's like once they let go of this mistake that they made, they were able to move through this quickly. But um, then the, the last two tasks, there was very little gesture in this. And so this is where I'm talking about that it supports the work that gestures transform they were mostly explaining ideas to one another. They'd already done the hard work of struggling with the symbolism and what each of these things meant. And, and so they quickly went through this. So for example, with this one, Kelly says, oh, well, this is just a product of a complex number and the reciprocal of another complex number, as she points to the two complex numbers. And so it's just going to be a rotate and dilate. It's, not, it's nothing fancy right here. And then for the second one, what I thought was interesting about this work, this task, is that remember in Dan and Howard's work, I said that they always tended to go to the Cartesian form? They quickly rewrote things just using Z notation, okay? And so instead of having A plus or X plus I, Y, they're like, okay, here's Z, and we know that in order to look at one over Z, that that's going to live down here. But in order to look at division, I need to multiply numerator and denominator by z conjugate. So they quickly figure out where z conjugate is and where 1 over z conjugate is. And then they just start putting everything together really quickly. Okay. Let's see. Um, that's all I want to say about that. I want to talk about the analytic tasks. So remember I told you that I interviewed mathematicians in terms of the arithmetic and analytic tasks. So the analytic tasks were, well, these are the three main ones. I also talk about the cauchy riemann equations because that's part of this uh, derivative task. But I asked them how they think about continuity, differentiation, and integration <coughs> geometrically. And we've already published a paper on the first one of continuity, and I'll just quickly tell you the results of that one. What we found is that uh, the mathematicians all came up with metaphors that somehow were related to their institution, to childhood activities, 
uh, to things that their students could associate with, and then they animated those gestures and so provided iconic gestures that represented these things. The, the interesting part about their metaphors, though, is that they did not match the mathematical definition of continuity. So if you're familiar with continuity, continuity it says starts with something in the co-domain, something that's supposed to happen over here. How can you make that things be in the domain so that that takes place? And all of their metaphors started off with things over here in the domain are going to behave in this way so that things happen over here. And the idea is that things are close over here are going to end up close over here. Okay, so that's the gist of that paper. Um, this next one, what is the derivative of a complex value function and uh, in integration? We're actually going to present this at room. But oh, I have a grad student who has already done some research on this, and I've already taken this into the classroom based on the results that we've seen for both differentiation and integration. And I want to talk a little, oh, I want to show you this video. This, you have to see this. If we do nothing else, we have to watch mm -hmm. this. So this is Rafael, can you see it? No. This is going to be Rafael talking about differentiation. Voice. Uh, this whole div is going to get multiplied by a complex constant. So it's going to rotate the disk and expand it out. So it's like having a turntable table that you can spin and expand. And that's what the complex linear math is doing. So it's taking the patch of a plane and almost treating like a rigid body, rotating it. He's my movie star. <laughs> Alright, so how did I how did I undo all this? There we go. And there we go. Alright, so this was uh, Rafael's video and here's what here was the takeaway from all of the mathematicians interview tasks is that they talked about differentiation as something that happens locally, so it's that small patch, and you're going to rotate it and dilate it. So in other words, what it's doing, it's an approximation of the behavior of the function at that point if you were to take a little circle. And they go on to talk about, well, if you take a little circle around some point, then it should get mapped to something that looks almost like a circle. Okay? And so it's things happening here, it's where does it get mapped to over here, right? And so all of them talked about that, this locality aspect, uh, so here's differentiation of any mapping means in a small patch could be approximated by an expansion and a rotation, a small displacement vector uniformly approximated by an expansion and a rotation, so forth. So we get different circles around this unit circle. He's talking about if you have a point right here and you take a small circle right there, it's going to expand and rotate differently than another little circle that we might have somewhere along on the unit circle. Okay? And Luke gave a similar explanation right here, similar sort of gesturing. And so then what I wanted to do is I wanted to create a lab where my students could discover that this is what differentiation was, all right? And my student went off to do research in this, and uh, one of the things that the students struggled with was the locality aspect. And so it took a lot of probing in order to get them to that locality aspect, but we did get them to talk about the rotation and the dilation, and with some probing got to um, got to the locality aspect. So then, based on that, oh, by the way, they also talked about the slope of the tangent line. So I knew that that was going to be problematic. So in taking this into the classroom, what I knew I had to do is I had to revisit the derivative of real value functions. 
because right now what happens is in a calculus, a real value calculus class, is students tend to think about functions that live right here. If you think about x squared, you envision this thing and x squared. I wanted my students to quit thinking that way. I wanted them to think about functions that live, start off with a domain here and get mapped here. So go from R to R. That was important for me so that then when they talk about complex functions, we could talk about going from the complex plane to the complex plane. Okay? And so I, I know I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go, go through that real quick. But um, basically what that meant is having them rethink about real valued functions as mappings from R to R. And again, what I did, let me just get to this, is created these uh, labs, which by the way have been used at various institutions. This is at a military institution. Look at their hands. Can you see them? They're doing this rotation. They're talking about vectors right here. They're talking uh, about vectors over here that are going to end up being rotated. So these are students at other institutions using these same labs that I have no interaction with these students whatsoever. But we're seeing the same sort of gesturing with them and same conversations. Um, I'm not going to go through the lab. Here's kind of what it looks like. What, what I want to end up with is just this sentence right here. Making, building, creating, moving leads to imagining, leads to perceiving, and discriminating. Okay? These are Ricardo's words, not mine. But I truly do believe them. These are some of the sorts of things that I do with my students. This is. Uh, with pre-service elementary teachers, I have these giant tarps where I've created grids and they do translations, rotations, and we talk about reflections where somebody acts as the pre-image and somebody acts as the image um, on, on this tarp. So we're doing transformations on these tarps. I've also done complex numbers, multiplying complex numbers as this tarp because I don't have a nice tile floor like the way Ricardo did. Um, they start imagining what measuring can be like. A lot of times you think about measurement it means that you have to have units. They start to think about measuring just means that we can line things up and they're the same length. And so they use their rope as measurement tools. Um, I have one video file that I, I'll, I'll stop with. And this is stereographic projection. If you guys are familiar with this, this is you have a point on the sphere and you want to map it to a flat surface. This is the way we make maps. And so you take a string at the North Pole, you connect it to your point Q, and you extend that, and wherever it hits the plane, that's the image. And so this is important for my students when they learn about inversions, because when they first learn about inversions, it's hard for them to imagine all of this. And so I've learned by doing stereographic projections that they can actually have a better idea of what's going to happen under an inversion. And the student that you saw at the beginning of uh, on the title page is he's supposed to look at the inversion of a great circle. So that's a circle that passes through the North Pole. He's already looked at the image of a circle that doesn't pass through the North Pole. And he's standing there. He's like tired of using string and paper and all that. He stands up and he's like, okay, wait. So we have this, this north pole. And this part's going to go this way, this half, and this half. Oh my gosh, it's a line. Okay? So no work, no taking string or anything. But he's done enough that he can, he can start to imagine what's going to happen. Okay? Um, I should leave five minutes for questions. I, I have a lot I could talk about. I was going to talk about my witches' hats that my students make, but I won't. We can, we can run by 5:30. What? We can run past 5:30. Well, can I show you my last two videos? That's really all I would like to. I want you to get a little glimpse of what happens. Thank you, by the way. Let's see. I want to show you this one. So, this is my students in. Um, in this second semester of higher geometry, and they're doing the stereographic projection activities that I've just talked about. 
and they have already looked at the mapping of a circle that's actually centered about the South Pole. And for some reason, this group was not interested in using string whatsoever. They used like their camera and the light from their camera to look at the reflections. That's, and it worked just great. So let me move this over and play this for you. Bigger circle. <laughs> like intersecting it. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of looks like a little tree circle. It's going to look like all of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's not going to be like the whole thing. It's going to be a little bit more than that. It's going to be like a little bit more than that. It's going to be a little bit more than that. It's going to be a little bit more than that. It's going to be a little bit more than that. It's going to be a little bit more than that. It's going to be a little bit more than that. The line from the circle from the North Pole going through the sphere like this gets kind of skewed because the angle like is more vertical here, I guess, than it is here. What does that mean, more vertical? Um, slope, uh, or more slope, sorry. Like here would be a fairly quadrilaterals, which are quadrilaterals whose angle sum is less than 360. And I haven't said anything about these things at all, but I've had them build a witch's hat. They have no idea why they're building it, but they know I'm crazy. And it's Halloween time, but I have them build this witch's hat, and I give them the instructions for it. And then they're supposed to bring it into class and tell me about, you know, what was the experience of building this thing. And so they tell me, you know, like, we found out that the bottom circle that we used, if the part that we cut out is really the piece that we use at the top. And so they share all of these different experiences with me. And then we have their witches hats there. And the following day, I talk about a Sashiri quadrilateral and I give them a working definition for it. And I say, how can we build it? Like, where, where would we see one of these things? And the video I wanted to show you was one of the girls says, oh, this is what it would look like on the witch's hat. And so they recognize that the witch's hat then can be a model for hyperbolic geometry. And, and so that's the introduction to why can uh, this witch's hat be our model. And we continue on. And that's what we're doing right now in class. So I know that was a lot. But thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, I'm curious, did you get a chance after you did all this work to either re like visit or think back on the gestures of the professor that you said kind of inspired your interest initially? We had all these, so you could see his like images and stuff like that, or images? Um, so, <laughs> yes, okay. and um, I can say that one of my participants is that said instructor, and so 
when I took the class from that instructor, I never was paying attention to gestures. That wasn't in the back of my mind. I was looking at pictures that were being sketched. Mostly I was listening to the language. And I think what happened, honestly, is that I had already so much symbolism that I didn't have the need to write a lot of symbolism anymore that I, listening to the words now made a lot more sense and I could connect that to the algebraic symbolism. I have reflected in that manner and I think that I was just ready for a picture and I wasn't before. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Other questions? Dora. Okay, it so happens I'm currently organizing uh, together with uh, Alejandro Andrade from uh, Bloomington a symposium for CSEL, Computer Supported Collaborative Learning. Deadline this Friday. Thanks. And, and the this is the second time he's told me that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't sent in there. Um, and, and people, one of the groups is uh, Mitch Nathan, Ali Willey, and, and uh, Candace Morganton, and, and Rob Lindgren, and etc. And, and our, our work, and about six papers. And what I'm discerning there, and this is all going to go back to this this gesture, and ultimately I'll ask you, should we just teach kids the gesture? And well, this is the point that this uh, we some researchers are saying let's create conditions where students will, through struggle, develop new sensory motor coordinations that then through discourse will come forth as gestures, and then will become shared meaning, etc. Other people, that's kind of my lab, and others. Uh, other people, the Wisconsin group is saying, no, no. and also, uh, you know, Ali Billy's mm -hmm. professor, Susan Golden Meadow, you, know, yeah. you, you see, say, well, no, you can just literally gesture and show them the gesture and tell them to gesture, literally cue the motions themselves and have them say, okay, now everybody move this way. And later that will kind of induce me. And so our symposium is, is on this tension and say, hey guys, let's talk, we're all having positive findings, what's going on, where, what, where do you stand on this? What I think that's a really good question because I, I don't think that I stand on either side. I think both are very important. For me, um, there's a lot of times where I do say, put your pencils down and look at my hands because the symbols don't make any sense to the students. And so I know I'm about to put some symbols up there that are gonna, they're not going to be happy about. And so I'm trying to, to attach some meaning before I actually introduce the symbolism. And so I try to do that with my hands. But like I said, there's lots of times where I will say, hey, let's look at so-and-so's gestures. Just like we ask students to revoice someone else's idea, I think that there's some strength to asking students to try to interpret what the gestures mean and and bring them to the forefront. But like everything else, I think students have to be ready. It's about timing. When when are your students going to be ready to receive that or to accept that as a way of learning? And I, I think you have to take the temperature of the room to see if your students are ready for that or not. I mean, what do you take from that student who says, oh, well, now that's why he was doing that. Where did that stand in her cosmos? Uh, I, I, that's still one of my favorite lines because I was there every single day and I saw every time he did that and it was just unbelievable. And I was surprised nobody ever asked him about it. And I was surprised. So <laughs> yes, yes. And I was surprised he never said anything about it. But as we know, a lot of times we gesture and it's unconscious. And I think for mathematicians that is the case because they're not attuned to want the research, uh, attuned to, you know, just to the other ways of conveying mathematics. And they, I don't think that they really recognize that that's what they're doing. It's like an expert's blind spot. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I, I'm not gonna say that I don't think that we, I don't think it's teaching gesture. That for sure, I, I know that that's not my thing. I think it's making students aware of gesture as another way of communicating. Some people have asked me, oh, so is there only one way to gesture slope? Uh, no. 
<laughs> but I, that's, that's the take and a share. How are the students gesturing about it? And that, to me, is what's important, not how I gesture about it. I don't know if I answered your question. Other questions, comments, concerns? Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.